you should all know basic Buddhism is that the way to enlightenment is the Eightfold Path. And that was said again and again and again. You know, such as first 274 of our Dhammapada, Ezo wa mago nati anyo dasana suvisudhiya. And I say that in Pali because I just want to impress you that I have done my studies. I don't just speak for my own uh, ideas. This is everything I say today is based on the sutras of the Buddha. So what that means, that's the Pali, it means this is the only path, there is no other for the purification of insight. Referring to the eightfold path. So you have the Eightfold Path, is the basic teaching of Buddhism as a way to enlightenment. And as you should all know, because many of you have done your basic studies of Buddhism, the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, number eight, Sama Samadhi, is always, every time, maybe 150, 200 times, defined by the Buddha as jhana. First, second, third, or fourth jhana. He never mentions anything else. To fulfill the Eightfold Path, it has to be jhana and nothing else. So I was very fortunate to be taught this from the very early times and be encouraged to develop meditation to the point where you can enter and experience the amazing, wonderful jhana. And it was such experiences which made me a monk. Now, because I'm a Western monk, I can say things that maybe uh, Chinese monks can never say. <laughs> and one of the things I say is, the first time I got into a deep meditation, I was still a layman. And I had a girlfriend. And strange thing, I need to say this, uh, I was sleeping with my girlfriend, and I remember just sleeping with her and then leaving her in Gloucester in England and going to Cambridge for a meditation retreat. And when I was on this retreat, I got a very wonderful meditation. And that was where I realized, my goodness, the bliss of meditation is better than sex. And I just, you know, about a week earlier, just had sex with my girlfriend and I was in meditation and this was much more profound, more pleasurable, more longer lasting, and also there was no chance of having babies. <laughs> now, of course, that really surprised me. Why is it that something could be so profound, so deep, so intensely pleasurable? Why didn't anybody tell me about that beforehand? And that really got me interested to see that you know, the important things of life, the pleasures of life, there's another whole area in the realm of meditation where you can get very deep, very still, very blissful, but also amazing insights. And when you started reading the teachings of the Buddha and found out, yes, now that's the, the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path. It's important, it's necessary if any of you want to become enlightened. So, ex to explain what a jhana is and explain how this meditation works. Last night I gave a little simile. And it starts from um, understanding that meditation, you're, it's an English speaking group here. It would be much better if you were Chinese speaking because sometimes in English we get the words wrong. For many, many years we've called meditation, concentration. That is a very bad translation. So for many, about four or five years now, I've been using the word stillness for the eighth factor, for samadhi. Samadhi, not concentration, but stillness. And it was only last year we had uh, a lady, she was a professor from MIT in uh, Boston, US. And when she heard me talking about meditation or samadhi being stillness, because she had read the Agamas, you know, the Chinese sutras, she said, of course it means stillness. 
because the two Chinese characters for samadhi in the Agamas, as I mentioned last night, are Xu and Guan, which I probably pronounce terribly, but Xu is the character for stillness. Guan means uh, observing. Guan, yeah. Guan. And the first one, stillness, Xu. Guan, yeah, and, and stillness is Su. Su, yeah, that stillness. Now that's how the Chinese masters translated the word samadhi maybe 1500 or 2000 years ago. And they got it right. Westerners, we got it wrong. It's not concentration, it's stillness. The more still your mind, the closer you are to these jhanas. How to get still, as I mentioned, how many of you were there last night? Please put your hand up. Okay, great, all there. So I'll just mention this very briefly. Now I held a cup up and I asked, you know, you, can you please tell me when it becomes still? And the more you hold it, the harder you try, the more it moves. The only way to get a cup of water still is to put it down, to let it go, and it becomes still all by itself. It's the nature of this water to be still. Only when I hold it does it shake. It's the nature of your mind to be still. Only when you grasp it does it move. So the whole trick of meditation is learning how to let things go, leave them alone, put them down, so the mind becomes more and more still. Now the wrong way of practice, number one. That number one is holding it. Number two, you let it go, you put it down. And after maybe one or two minutes, is it still yet? No, not yet. <laughs> still yet? No, not quite yet. When are you going to become still? Come on. <laughs> Please don't interfere with the process. Your job in meditation is to let go and continue letting go and just to let things happen. You are like a passenger. Not on MH, not on Air Asia, not N on SQ, on Buddha Air. Now, once you get on Buddha Air, all you need to do is sit down in your seat, put on your seat belt, and you don't need to do anything else. You can't go and send a message to the pilot can you please hurry up? I've got to get to the destination quicker today. Or can you please take shortcut? And I'm just coming into KK for the first time. Can you just do a pass around Mount Kota Kinabalu so I can see it? No matter what you want, that pilot will pay no attention to you. So when you are traveling in an aircraft, all you do is sit down, shut up, and enjoy the journey, which is what you do when you meditate. Sit down and let go. Now I'm going to tell you one of the most profound descriptions of meditation from Ajahn Chah, from my teacher. Unfortunately, I don't know why, this has never been put in any of his books. Uh, I tried to put it in one of my books, so at least it's recorded. Because when I first went to become a monk with Ajahn Chah in 1974, I think it was, he would repeat this story many times. And then he'd stop talking about it. He never repeated it. But I remember the first year he kept saying that his monastery in the northeast Thailand was a mango orchard. There's no mango trees there. I wondered what he was talking about. And he said in that monastery, those mangoes were planted by the Buddha. Now I realized he was making a simile. And he said those mangoes were planted by the Buddha many hundreds of years ago. Now all those trees are mature, 
And in every branch, there was very beautiful, delicious, sweet, ripe mangoes. Thousands of them, he said. And you monks, he told us, don't need to climb the tree to get a mango. You don't need to shake the tree, nor do you need to throw a stick up to get the mango to fall. You monks, because of the wisdom of the Buddha, all you need to do, he said, to get a mango is to sit under the mango tree, hold out your hand, and a mango will fall. I thought that was crazy. You've seen mango trees. If you sit on a ma under a mango tree and hold out your hand, you'll be waiting there for hours, maybe days, before one falls. And if it does fall, it's more likely to fall on your head than in your head, at least with my luck. But, obviously he meant something much more profound. He said, if you want to achieve a jhana or enlightenment, you must not shake the tree. You must not climb the tree or throw things at the tree. Your job, open up your heart, your mind. Be still and all these things will fall into your palm. And that's exactly what happens. Many, many, many times I have lay people on the retreats which I teach getting into jhanas for the first time by accident. <laughs> well, there, a good example is this girl from, from KL who was teaching a retreat, I think it was in Phuket, and she was meditating and meditating, trying her best, and after nine days, got nowhere. For those of you who've meditated, you may understand what she felt like. Really getting up early, putting lots of time meditating, but never actually getting much peace. So she basically, she gave up. But there was another hour before her taxi came to take her to the airport. Oh no, sorry, another hour before lunch. And after lunch she was going to the airport to fly back to KL. She had an hour to kill. So she just sat down and meditated. But the first time she wasn't expecting anything. She was just killing time. And after the meditation she came up to me, squatting on the floor with her hands up, Ajabram, at last, I've got something in my meditation. <laughs> she got her first deep meditation, it was very sweet to see. And it was also because for the first time, she really let go. She climbed on the aircraft, Buddha Air, and stopped making demands, stopped asking for things. She had let go. In the Buddha's teachings, just before the Buddha became enlightened. He went to the river Niranjara. He put his bowl in the river and made a resolution. If I am to become enlightened, may my bowl flow against the current, against the stream. And those of you who know your story of the Buddha will know that that bowl flew, uh, floated upstream against the current. It was a sign the Buddha was be going to become the Buddha. But also, it was telling you how to become a Buddha, to go against the stream of craving. To go against the stream of craving does not mean craving to stop craving. It means going in a very different direction. I've already told you that the way to get deep meditation is to let go. So some of my stupid disciples in Australia, okay, I've got to let go. They close their eyes, come on, let go. Let go. Come on, let go. Let go. Let go. <laughs> now, of course, that's not letting go. That's trying to let go. What I mean is letting go of trying. 
taking this little thing inside called your will, calming it down so it gives no orders, it gives no commands. You are mindful, one, and still. Shh. If you can do that, you're on the path to meditation. Because what happens when things are still, they disappear. Have you ever noticed that when there's a sound of, say, the fans, now you can hear it, maybe a minute or two ago you weren't conscious of it. Because the sound doesn't change, our mind stops hearing it. Our brain is only um, wired to notice things which change. If they are still, they disappear. And a good example, when you do meditate and you close your eyes, you may notice what you see at first is the inside of your eyelids, it's dark. But because that does not change, after a while, your sense of seeing turns off, it stops. You're not seeing blackness anymore, you're not seeing anything. The sense of seeing has stopped. It's just a function of the brain. If you're sitting perfectly still, if nothing is moving, your body disappears. That's what's meant to happen. So many times you're sitting there and you can't feel your legs or your bottom or your hands or anything. That's fine. That's what's supposed to happen because nothing is moving, it vanishes. Listen, there was a Malaysian couple <laughs> living in Perth and they told me once they were so focused on the movie they were watching at home that everything else disappeared. They were totally focused on the movie. And once the movie was finished, one of them went up to go to the toilet, the other one went up to make a cup of tea. And only when they got up, they noticed that several things were missing from their from their house. Even just behind them, many things had disappeared. And they soon realized a burglar had been into the house and had actually been right behind them and taking things from the shelf right behind them. And they hadn't heard anything. You know why? Because they were totally focused on the movie. And everything else had disappeared. This is how things disappear. When the mind is focused and still on one thing, everything disappears. So the way to become still is a very well-traveled path. The first thing when we meditate is to keep in the present moment so that time disappears. Too often we are caught between the past and the future and most of our brain moves from one to the other so much so that time never stands still. We're always on the move. If you can find yourself in the present moment, soon the whole meaning of time vanishes. All time is is a measurement between the past and the present, the past or the future, or the present and the future. It's just a, a measurement between two or more moments of time. In the present moment, there's no way of measuring anymore. Time stands still and time disappears. All of you who are prisoners of time, just getting to that stage of meditation where time vanishes is a wonderful experience. You don't know whether you've meditated for five minutes or an hour or five hours. You've been perfectly alert, but no longer a prisoner of time. It's vanished. The next thing which vanishes is your thinking. We think far too much 
our mind moves. But when the mind becomes still, all that thinking vanishes. I will now show you what I mean. As I am speaking, I also want you to be aware of what's happening inside of your own mind as I speak. Because as I am speaking, you will begin to notice that there are spaces between my words. In those gaps, what was happening inside your mind? You were aware, but not saying anything, not thinking. There it was again. <laughs> that is called silent awareness. You're perfectly alert, but no inner chatter. Understand? Why don't you just experience that again? Or many of the business of your life, because it still vanishes. You feel a great sense of freedom. So then, because you're sitting still, you can't feel the legs after a while, the hands, the, the body or the head. You know the one thing which keeps on moving, no matter how, uh, how you sit meditation, there's still one thing left which is moving. <sighs> your breath, your lungs are still moving. Which is why in meditation, even if you don't try to watch your breath, your breath will appear to you. Time has disappeared, the inner commentary has disappeared, the body has disappeared because it's still, it's not moving. The breath still moves. That is one of the reasons why the Buddha taught the breath meditation. It's natural. Whether you choose to do it or not, it just happens. So you're just sitting there watching the breath go in, watching the breath go out. Because you're not doing very much, you don't need so much oxygen. Your breath gets softer and smoother. Until, again, this happens naturally, you don't have to try and do anything until the in-breath and the out-breath appear pretty much the same. Just a smooth experience of breathing. When there's hardly any difference between the beginning and the end of an in-breath or the out-breath, when your breath gets very, very smooth, when there's no change, what do you think happens next? Your breath disappears. And with it, the last part of your five senses vanishes. Because of stillness, they disappear. Sight has turned off, hearing has turned off, smell, taste, and now the difficult body is turned off. It's one of the reasons why we try and sit in quiet places, or at least places where the sound doesn't change, so that the sense of sound can also turn off. When the five senses have turned off, only then can we experience the sixth sense, which is the mind. You may all know from your Buddhism, there are six senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and mind, or knowing, and this is what we're doing in this meditation. We're coming to that sixth sense. Any chemist, if you want to find the property of any element, you have to purify it first of all. Just like the Buddha said, if you want to find out the properties of pure gold, you have to take that gold and first of all make sure there's no other trace elements. There's only 100% pure gold and then you can find out its properties. In the same way, if you want to know what this mind is, the chitta, you have to make sure all the other uh, elements, the other five senses have disappeared and then you can actually understand what your mind truly is. When the five senses disappear, what usually happens is people see this beautiful light in the mind. 
They have a word for it in Buddhist meditation called a nimitta. Beautiful, radiant, like a flashlight, like a moon, like the sun, it can get incredibly powerful. That is to be expected. I mention this to you because it happens to many meditators. When that comes up, people usually get excited or afraid. Please understand those are the two main obstacles to jhanas. Fear and excitement. The only reason is excitement is because you think this is another great attainment. Your sense of self gets in the way. And the same as fear. You're about to lose something which you're very attached to. Allow it to go. You're finding out some very deep and powerful insights into what the Buddha taught. The Buddha said, that mind is radiant. He called it Prabhasara Jitta. And now you have it right in front of you. And it takes a lot of skill to be able to get that nimitta just to be quiet, calm, for it to become still. Your mind has to become still. Stop doing things. Really relax until that nimitta just stays there. And then you will experience one of the two possibilities of falling into that nimitta or that nimitta coming to in envelop you. And at that time, you're not experiencing a nimitta or a mental image anymore. Now you're in those jhanas. And what you're experiencing is extremely strange, nothing like you've experienced before. You come out afterwards, you'd have got into the greatest state of bliss you've experienced for a long time, forever, for many lifetimes. You've got one of the great bliss states, ecstasies, bliss better than sex, lasting for hours. And I say that because it's marketing. People get very interested when I say that. And for those people who say, oh my goodness, I will get attached to that happiness. Well done. You are supposed to get attached to that happiness. As the Buddha said in the Pasadika Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, this will be, be taped, you can look it up yourself afterwards. The Buddha said, if anyone says, oh, you'll get attached to the happinesses of those jhanas, you should say to them, yes. But anyone who gets attached to the happiness of the jhanas can expect only one of four things. This is what happens if you do get attached to the happiness of jhanas. The four possibilities, only four, not five, stream winning, once returning, non-returning, or full enlightenment. That's what we're supposed to do. It's a path to enlightenment. So indulge in it. The Buddha said many other pleasures, especially for monks and nuns. There's so many things we can't enjoy. You can't enjoy movies, you can't enjoy sex, you can't enjoy food, you can't enjoy this, you can't enjoy that. You know what? That's why they call in English, they call them nuns. None of this, none of that. <laughs> but the one thing we can enjoy are the pleasures of the mind. The Buddha said, Nabhayita bang, Bhaweta bang, Bahurikata bang, Asewita bang, to those pleasures. In the Aranavibhanga Sutta, for one, many other places too. Don't be afraid of those pleasures. Follow them, make much of them, develop them. And that's the Buddha's advice. So when you do get happiness in meditation, don't be scared. You're on the path. This is what's supposed to happen. Enjoy it. Now when you come out of those jhanas, that's when you get incredible insights, especially into non-self. To so give you an idea what I mean, and then we'll open it up for questions. This is my last simile. Once there was a little tadpole. A little tadpole, she was swimming in the lake, but she was very smart little tadpole. So when she started hearing dry land, dry land, dry land, she wondered what they were talking about. And they said, oh, that's the place where there's no water. And she said, what's water? Because how can a tadpole know what water is? 
when she's born in water and lived all her life in water. She even went to university and did courses on chemistry about what water is, H2O. She even went to Abhidharma classes on water. But it doesn't matter, she still can't understand what water is. Because it's always been there. One day, little tadpole, something strange happens to her body. Little legs and little arms start to come out from her body. And they grow and grow and grow. Little tadpole is becoming a frog. And once she has developed her legs and arms, one day she jumps out of the lake. And that's the strangest experience she's ever had. All her life, all she's ever known is being in water. Now something which was always there, so much she never noticed it, has now vanished. It's disappeared. Now, little tadpole knows, ah, that's what water was. The thing which is no longer there. That is the wonderful simile for the insights which happen from jhanas. Do you think you can really understand your body? What it is? You can learn from all the monks and nuns about the nature of this body. You can become a professor of medicine. Still you don't really understand this body because you're always in it. You've never known anything else except being a woman, being a man. One day you grow your little meditation legs and you jump out of the body with its five senses. Now you know what this body is. You know one of the first things you realize? This body is a pain in the neck. It really is suffering. I mean, big time suffering, much more than you can imagine. And that's one of the reasons why when you get into jhanas, it's bliss. Just like you've let go of this very, very, very heavy burden. Just like you've been carrying a backpack a rucksack on your back all your life, as long as you can remember so much, you've got used to it. And now you put it down for the first time. Oh, this is so nice. No, wait, I'm free at last. That's what it's like to let go of the body. That's the main reason why that you have the happiness and bliss in the first jhana. It's called Viveka Jasuka. The happiness, the bliss, Born of Viveka means separation from the five senses and this body. When you get into a second jhana, oh now you're really blissing out. This bliss is even more. You think that the first jhana is the best you can possibly ever have. But this is more bliss, thousand times more bliss than even the first jhana. And there you really are still like a rock. Nothing moves. You can't even come out. You're stuck, blissfully stuck, having a time of your life. You know why? There's something you call the will, the choice, the person who you think chose to come here today, the person who just scratched his forehead, the person who just scratched his nose, the woman who just scratched her hair at the back, <laughs> the one who's scratching his nose right now. <laughs> did you do that? You think you did, but actually, sir, you did not. That was an automatic response. It appeared like it came from you. But what happens in the second jhana? The will has totally vanished. Now you know what that will is. You can't know a thing when it's always there. A fish can't understand water. A frog can, because it can get out of the water. You have now left will. Now you know what it is. 
nothing to do with you. This is one of the scariest teachings. In Singapore many years ago, I was giving all the teachings like I gave last night. The fun teachings, such as the going into the chicken shed and collecting the chicken poo. Things about, <laughs> about good, bad, who knows. But after a while they said, oh, we've heard those stories and jokes many times. Can you teach us some deep dhamma? So I said, okay, I'll teach you some deep dhamma on non-self. And I taught them that and the following day they complained. That was too deep. We couldn't sleep last night. <laughs> but I don't care. After a second jhana, what vanishes is the will. That's real samadhi. It's samadhi sukha. The bliss born of total stillness. Now you know this will is not your friend. It is your enemy. Number one, enemy. You really come here, many of you, to learn Buddhism, thinking if you can just make your will more smart, have more skillful means, you won't need to suffer anymore. In your life, in your career, if you can actually make the right choices, then you can alleviate suffering. Once you understand what this will is, you understand that no, it's nothing to do with you. It's non-self. As the Buddha often said, there's no one inside. So who chooses? Who makes those choices inside of you? It appears that it's you. That's a delusion. Now you sometimes have to try and break through that delusion. And basically jhanas are the only way you can break through. Tadpole has to become a frog and jump out of the lake. That's the only way to know what water is. If you haven't jumped out of the lake of will, you'll never understand what will is. All of you, you know that uh, person in Buddhism called Mara? No, Mara? Mala, yeah. You know he's the deva. He lives in the realm, the Paranimata Vasavati realm. He's the head of that realm. This is the realm of those who wield power over others. He is control freak, in chief of the universe. There's another control freak inside of you. It's called will, Chaitanya, always controlling you, never giving you a moment's peace. Come on, work harder. Come on, meditate harder. Come on, be smarter. Learn more things. Exercise. Do this. Do that. That is the problem, not the solution. So after a while, you see that that's not yours. Nothing to do with you. It's disappeared. You aren't the one who chose to come here today. All cause and effect you had no choice. It appeared you did. That's a delusion. Good example of that, before I, I said it was a lot, I should actually finish to keep my promise. So that's jhanas, that's non-self, at least half of it anyway, realizing you are not the one in charge. There is no doer. The will, you think it's under your control, but it ain't. That's enough to give you an understanding of how non-self and jhanas all come together. Just one last little quote from Visuddhimagga. The path is, but no traveler on it is seen. If you try to meditate, there is no path for you. The traveler, the meditator, has to disappear first. The path is, but no traveler on it is seen. Let go, disappear. Sit down on Buddha air, shut up. And what happens after a few minutes? This flight attendant comes, this beautiful girl, and comes, Ajahn Brahm, 
Would you like some, the in-flight service, not the in-flight service, so the insight service. The insight service. Would you like some uh, jhana today? Jhana's on the menu. And I'm just sitting there and say, oh, first, second, third, fourth, um, I think I'll take third today, thank you. And they come a few minutes later and give you third jhana. You don't do anything. You don't search for it. You just sit there and wait. And a third jhana comes to you. And later on in the flight, they come along and say, um, on the menu for lunch, we have uh, stream winning, once returning, non-returning, and arahat. Which one would you like? So oh, I had non-returning last time. Please give me arahat this time. Everything is served to you. You don't need to go pressing the call button for the attendant. You know, they get very upset when you keep pressing that call button. <laughs> you just sit there and everything comes to you. That's how it works. No will. No shaking the Bodhi tree. Stand under it, open your hand, and all the fruits, the passing fruits, will fall into you. So that's jhanas and non-self. So it's easy. So easy, you don't have to do anything. That is the hardest thing for anyone to achieve. That's why few people get in line, because they just, they keep on interfering. See if you can just let go.